out of that, Lord, Lord, may the word change me. Matthew 21, verse number 1, if you will look at this with me this morning, very familiar scripture for each of you. Now, when, when, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to, to Bethpage, the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey, a donkey tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord. Everybody say the Lord. The Lord, the Lord has needed them and immediately he sent them. And all that was done, this was all done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. Look at this now. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming. I, I, I got word for you today. Your king is coming. Amen. Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went. And did as Jesus commanded. And they, they brought the donkey and the colt and they laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then the multitudes went before him. Look at this scene now. Just picture this in your mind. And then the multitudes went before and, and those and who followed. And they cried out, Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. They're identifying him as king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when, now let, let, me, let me read 9 again. I want you to look at this. The multitudes who were before, who went before and those who followed, they were all crying, people in the front, people in the back. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? Why are you singing and praising if you don't know who this is? Hmm. Sitting in church doesn't mean you know who Jesus is. We have this scene, and you guys know this scene is the scene of the triumphant entry. I want to tell you today, their Savior came, but they would not have him. In 2018, whenever I look at America, I feel like saying their Savior came, but they would not have him. This story doesn't end here. If you go into the other Gospels and you go into Luke chapter 19, verses 39 through 41, it says this, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teach you, rebuke your disciples. You guys know this, but he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should remain silent, if the people remain silent, then the stones would immediately cry out. If the people don't praise me, the stones will. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The earth knows how to praise him. I don't want no stones crying out in my place. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over the city. I want you to picture this scene just for a moment before I move into what I have for you. I want you to picture Jesus setting up on the fold, Jesus setting up on the donkey, marching into Jerusalem. I want you to see Jesus getting to Jerusalem. I want you to see him looking at the city and weeping over the city. I, I, I need you to understand this morning, the only thing that makes you cry is when you're happy or when you're sad or when you're mad. Your emotions must be moved in order to weep. Their Savior came, but they would not have him. This text is known as the triumphal entry happening on Palm Sunday, which occurred one week prior to the resurrection of Jesus and on the Sunday prior to the Friday crucifixion. We're talking five days apart here. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem knowing full well that this trip would end in his sacrificial death. They are cheering Hosanna while Jesus knows this is the beginning of the end. The triumphant entry was the setting. We call it the triumphant entry, but it was the setting. It was the foundation preparing for the glorious exit. They didn't know that. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a young donkey. It was prophecy. Behold, your king is coming. Zechariah 9, your king is coming. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt. A, a, a king riding on a donkey also meant that he was coming in peace. 
If a king came into town, he was coming in peace. But you see, he came lowly, meek, and humble, and gentle. But don't mistake, don't listen to me, don't mistake humility and meekness for weakness. Humility and, and, and meekness and being humble is absolute power under perfect control. Jesus being able to ride on that donkey into that town is absolute power under perfect control. Many of the people acknowledged and treated him as royalty. The act of, of placing your coat or your cloaks and, and palm branches on the road was generally only done for kings and, and important rulers. The people went before him. Notice this now as, as we paint this picture. The people went before him and they were behind him. They were singing Hosanna, which means save now. They, they were shouting praise. And, and shouting Hosanna and singing praises. And his, his arrival during the week of Passover led to much attention, causing the city to be stirred up. The news, now check this out. I want you guys to notice this. The reason they're all stirred up is the news is still fresh of the miracles that Jesus had been performing. This, this is why they're a little excited. The, the people were astonished. And the rumor in the crowd is this. You see, sometimes when people get together, they tend to talk. The rumor in the crowd is that he, he walked right up to the tomb of Lazarus and that he, he, he looked at this tomb and even at that moment he had tears in his eyes and he simply said these words, come forth. And I could see a couple guys standing beside of each other saying, can you believe that man? He, he walked right up to that tomb and one guy says, you know what? I was there. I, I stood there. But let me tell you, suddenly something began to happen. Jesus is standing feet away from Lazarus' tomb and he speaks and he says, come forth. And all of a sudden, man, let me tell you what happened. All of a sudden, something began to move. All of a sudden, something began to happen, and, and the other guy was like, well, tell me, don't leave me hanging, man. Tell me. And the guy said, I'm telling you, man, all of a sudden, it was like a mummy came out of that tomb and just slowly began to walk. And all of a sudden, there, there's this person wrapped in grave clothes in front of us. I can imagine that guy saying, well, what did you do next? And the guy says, Jesus told me. Jesus looked at me and said, loose him and let him go. What would you do next? I walk slowly. You see, a lot of people think that this is just something that happens quickly. But I walk slowly. Dude, do you not know that he was dead four days? It's like getting sprayed on by a skunk, man. I slowly made my way over to this walking person and I slowly began to take off grave clothes and I loosened one end from another end and all of a sudden pieces begin to fall. And brother, let me tell you something right now. Make no mistake about it. I'll promise you, you can walk down this very road and find him sitting in his house. The man was dead four days, but when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, loose him, let him go, the man came to life. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw this miracle with my own eyes. And so he, he says, this is why I'm singing Hosea. Santa, there's something about Jesus. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, man, but there, there's something about it. I was scared to death, scared to death. But when he told me to do it, I did it. The people were excited but yet confused at the same time. That's why they said, who is this? Not everybody, not everybody knows who Jesus is. I'm sure as they stood in the crowd, they were pondering, could this really be our Messiah? But I came today to tell you a truth. I didn't come to paint you a pretty picture. I came to tell you a truth. Jesus knew he was the Messiah, but he also knew he was not the Messiah these people were looking for. They were not looking for a humble king riding on a donkey. They wanted a military king to come in power and authority to overthrow the Roman government so that Israel could regain its independence. That's what they wanted. This was a plea from a, an oppressed people seeking deliverance. Jesus knew this temporary popularity would be short-lived. Then the, they, they were blind to the true nature of his kingdom, you see, and he knew that they would ultimately reject him. When you're blind, you, cannot, you can see, but you can't see. 
They sought deliverance from Roman power while Jesus came to deliver them from sin. They, they wanted free from Rome. Jesus said, I want to free you from all of it. They said, we want free from Caesar. Jesus said, I'm going to free you from the earth. Amen. But they were too blind. Amen. And, 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 and in their disapproval, the same crowd that, 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 that came in and sang Hosanna, glory in the highest on Sunday was the very same crowd that on Friday that yelled crucify crucify him crucify him and you say pastor how can it be that the same people five days in between would view God on two totally different terms I don't know why don't you ask the people sitting next to you because it happens every week that people come into church they experience God and four days later they they The same crowd, the same crowd would turn. The people wanted the reestablishment of the earthly kingdom, but Jesus came to establish an eternal heavenly kingdom. Their Savior came, but they would not have him. The triumphant entry ended when Jesus came. Please picture this. When Jesus came near Jerusalem. Luke 19 tells us that he came near and when he beheld the city, when he looked at the city, he began to weep. He began to, to weep. The celebration ended with Jesus in tears and, and he knew that they did not understand. They would ultimately reject him. Why did he weep? Luke 19, 44 says that he told them, you do not know the time of your visitation. In other words, someone came to visit you. That was very important and you had no idea they were there. It says that Jesus wept and in, in the instant that he knew they were going to reject him, he said, when you reject me, they will come. They, they will destroy you. They will not leave one stone upon another stone. Jesus is weeping because he said, your king is right in front of you, but you cannot see him. Their king came, but they would not have him. And Jesus said, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. When you don't recognize the time of your visitations, households die without God. Generations die without God. People, schoolhouses, generations, posterities die without God because their Savior came, but they did not know him. Jesus knew their rebellion would bring them to destruction. Jesus wept because everything they needed was right in front of them. Let me talk to our current generation. Jesus wept because he knew everything they needed was right in front of him, yet they would reject him, refuse him. They would rebel against him. In blind ignorance, they would say no to Jesus. Every person in this room, make no mistake about it, every person has had a visitation or you will have a visitation. I know that some of you may not have come to church to hear preaching and singing and all that, but I'm going to ask you to give me the next half an hour or so of your time. I'm going to ask you to get off of Facebook and get off of Twitter and Snapchat and stop letting everything else, amen, deceive you right now because this preacher is about to give you some truth. I want the older generation to listen to me and I want the younger generation to listen to me because it's high time that somebody tell you the truth. You too will get a visitation. Everyone has an invitation to a temporary visitation, but your response determines whether it remains a visitation or a habitation. Jesus wept. Are you listening to me now? Now listen, I'm telling you right now, if you see somebody next to you and they're on that stuff and they're not listening to the preacher, you put your hand over and say, listen to what the man's got to say for the next little bit of time, all right? Especially the young people in this room. I know that some of you are confused. Some of you are upset. Some of you are mad. Some of you would rather be at home on your Xbox. Let this preacher give you some truth. Jesus wept because a, an entire generation was blind to the truth. Darkness and tradition had filled the hearts of the very people that he had come to save just like the day Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Today we are surrounded by darkness and unbelief. 
unbelief. Amen. Dark spiritual forces breed hate. Dark spiritual forces are breeding division. Dark spiritual forces are breeding compromise. Are you listening to me just for a few more minutes? Academia teaches trust nothing and question everything. Love and kindness seemingly have disappeared from homes and community. And like never before, Scripture is more true today than it has ever been. What Scripture, Pastor? Let me read it to you. Young people, listen to me. I will come down there and point you out. Get off the phone or I will come down and point you out. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Destructive times will come. You say to me, preacher, you can't prove a thing to me. If I don't prove a thing to you in the next few minutes, you are totally blind. Perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. That's how the preacher can say three times, get off your phone, and you continue to sit there on your phone. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving. We're living in a society of unloving people, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control. I saw a girl the other day that held up a sign. They all got signs, don't they? She held up a sign that said, going to hell and proud of it. Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Am I describing 2018 to anybody? Amen. We, we, we thought, hold on now, we thought it was 16, then we thought it was 17, but oh my God, look at 18. Amen. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. What do you do with such people? Turn away from them. Don't hang out with them. Don't listen to them because they're demonic and they're looking to turn you from God. <laughs> Society and academia seems determined. Please listen. Determined to destroy anything and everything that has to do with God and has to do with church. Society and academia determined to produce a generation full of atheists and agnostics. And I'm not going to lie to you, they're doing a decent job. They're doing a decent job. Come on, society and academia determined to produce a generation full of hate, full of compromise. And if something don't happen to this generation, they'll go down in history being known as the deceived generation. But what you don't understand is there were generations before you that were, that were deceived. And when they were deceived, millions of people lost their lives. Hmm. If this generation continues to believe the lies, it will be blinded and destroyed by a lack of knowledge. The enemy, listen to me. Yeah, I'm about to, I'm about to get on some touchy subjects, but somebody got to do it. The enemy wants us to be deceived in the debate of abortion. They want us to be deceived in the debate of Republican, Democrat, gay, straight, gender identity, stand or kneel, social rights, all inclusive, coexist. You see, they want you to believe that those are your issues. When you go to school, they want to tug at your heartstrings and tell you that everybody matters. And it's true, everybody does matter. But what they're doing is they're turning you off from God and the church. They're saying, How could a God condemn these people? It's not God condemning them, those people because Christians live in sin too, my friends. It's not God condemning those people. It's our choice of sin that condemns us, amen? But I'm going to tell you something. They'll tell you that the issue is abortion, Republican, Democrat, gay, straight, guns, gender identity, stand or kneel, when the real issue is morality, integrity, and character. That is the real issue at hand, and you can tell them that the preacher said so. <laughs> the 
Why do I say that? Because all hate starts with a seed of darkness. Murder starts with a seed of darkness. Gun violence starts in darkness, not by the manufacturer of the gun. Gun violence, killing babies, killing babies, the same people, I'm not trying to rain on your parade, but I'm telling you the truth. The same people holding a sign today that says, save a life, turn your gun in, tomorrow is holding a sign that says abortion is for everybody. They're fooling you. No, I'm not trying to get in your gun debate. I believe there's too much too. I believe there's a limit. But the same people that's lying to you is trying to take America down. It all begins. Racism, killing babies, abortion, violence, and crime. You cannot hate someone else of another race unless you've got darkness in your soul. You cannot kill a baby unless you've got darkness in your soul. Why are you saying that, preacher? Because it's not the stuff that academia and society is telling you that it is. It all begins in darkness. The only cure is Jesus. The only cure is Jesus. The only answer is Jesus. I've never met more confused people than there are in 2018. Why are we so confused? Because the Bible says when you begin to reason, it breeds confusion. Compromise. We don't know whether to go left or go right. We don't know whether to fly the American flag or the rainbow flag. We can't make a decision to kneel or to stand. We don't know what we are. Our birth certificates. Although our children are born with parts, we want birth certificates to remain blank so that they can choose. You don't have that choice, baby. That choice was made by your maker. Your maker who decided who you were is the one that decides what you are. Hold on. And they... They say, there's people in this, this very room right now, they say that's exactly the hate we're tired of. Listen to me. I'm going to preach to you, and if you want, call me this week, and you can preach to me. When, 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 you know, That's exactly what they've done to wash your brain. They, they've taught you to say anybody that speaks against this is full of hate. I'm going to tell you that the people telling you that are full of stupidity. Yeah. Full of it. It's not hate when the message that we're trying to relate to you is life saving. Yeah. Life, you see, those pe- the academia and the social elitists are trying to teach you things and they want you to pretend they care. They don't care. They want your vote, and they they want your time, and they want you to walk away from God. That's all they care about. And let me tell you what I care about, and then you determine who's telling the truth. I care about where you spend eternity. I could care I could care less about all this other stuff. I don't mind. Walking on eggshells here, I don't mind some of your protest. I don't mind some of your rallies, some of them, because some of them are just bred out of hate. But your rallies and your protests will not fix America. Revival will fix America. 
Jesus will fix America. This generation doesn't need a new cell phone. This generation don't need more smart people telling them how dumb religion is. I'll promise you this. If Stephen Hawking had another day, he'd be singing a different tune. How, how do you know that, preacher? You see, I'm persuaded. I'm convinced. And the reason you say, well, preacher, maybe you're not telling the truth. Let me say something to you. You listen to me, young people? College age, middle school, high school. I know some of you ain't because the more I talk, the more you stare at the floor. Because you don't want to hear what this preacher's got to say. They don't. Raised in church. Raised in church. Hit a certain age where you begin to question everything. Why do you think they're so inclined to give you all their attention and all of their input? Because the enemy knows that he is in his last days. And he's doing everything he can to get your attention. We don't need more posters. We don't necessarily need all of your rallies and all of your protests. Some of them are okay. Some of them are all right. Some of them are demonic. We don't necessarily need all of that. What we need is Jesus. What we need is revival. But I'm going to tell you, 2,000 years ago, their Savior came, but they would not have him. If 2018 does not wake up, generations to come will say their Savior came, but they would not have him. It breaks my heart that you would fall for the traps of people who want nothing more than a vote and not listen to people who are worried about your eternal salvation. Preacher, you're preaching hate. No. Jesus said, I chastise those I love. One reason this generation is such a mess is because parents have forgotten how to discipline in the first place. We treading ground now, huh? <laughs> Their Savior came, but they wouldn't have him. Well, preacher, you've got five minutes to make your case. Second Timothy 2 and 4 says, No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Preacher, you got five minutes. Five minutes. I realize I've been passionate today. Why have I been so passionate? Because your life depends on it. Preacher, I'm not used to this kind of preaching. Stick around. You will get used to it. Preacher, it seems like you're picking on one generation. No. Because there's a lot of baby boomers who have said, when I'm ready, I'll serve God. There's a lot of millennials that are so confused, they don't know which way to turn, which way to think. Preacher, tell us how to think. Uh-uh, that's not my job. When society and academia tries to tell you how to think, that's when you ought to know, oh, they're trying to deceive me. Well, preacher, tell me what I should do. Think like God thinks. Think like God thinks, okay? Preacher, you got five minutes to persuade me. There's a couple hundred people in this room who've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. A couple hundred people who've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. There's mothers in this room that were told they would never have a child. Yet God's hand reached further down than they could reach up and God blessed them with a child. That doesn't work good enough for you. There are former, they're not this now, 
There are drug addicts and alcoholics in this room that when they met Jesus, immediately, immediately, immediately God cleansed their body and pulled them out of alcohol and the drug addiction. Look around. Look around. You see, that is called proof. 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 If that's not enough, there are people in this room who were eat up with hate. And God set them free in the love of Jesus. And now they can forgive those who hurt them. You see, in this room, I can give you visual proof of what I tell you. The world, in their confusion and hate, cannot do that. In this room, on Tuesday, I'm going to interview a 90-year-old man whom the doctors told him 43 years ago, you'll not come back to another doctor visit. You will die. You are eat up with cancer. I'm going Tuesday to interview him just for more proof that just like him, there are people in this very room that the doctor said you'll not live to see another day, but God stepped in and said, I don't think so. I don't want to frighten you this morning if you're sitting there in confusion, but you're surrounded by people who've been pronounced dead. <laughs> and just like Lazarus, Jesus Christ said, come forth, and they stepped out of their disease. They stepped out of their sickness. They stepped out of their sin, and God said, loose him and let him go. <laughs> Preacher, you haven't convinced me yet. Let me know when academia gives you the same proof I'm giving you. My grandmother laid in her deathbed for more than two weeks, eat up with brain cancer, didn't speak to nobody, didn't talk to nobody. She had lost her mind. Death was just any moment to come. And they knew death was any moment. She was at CAMC, and this was my mother's mom and all the family was in the hospital room with my dad my dad was sitting in a window my grandmother who had been absent from her body for more than two weeks rolled over in her bed and said Larry honey you'll need to get out of that window and they all like the crowd that, that said Hosanna they all looked at each other mom mom my, my grandfather, her name was Louise. My, my grandfather, just like the TV show, he would say, Wheezy. <laughs> and she paused and she said, you'll need to move because those angels are coming for me. <laughs> those angels are coming for me. And... Within the next couple hours, within the next couple hours, those angels came in, picked up her spirit and her soul while her body lay there eaten with cancer. But God said to be absent from this body is to be present <laughs> with the Lord. I haven't convinced you just yet of how good God is. When all of life gives up on you, when all of life gives up on you, whoo, man, I'm on, I might have to preach for a little while. See, I can just scan this room and I can point out a hundred different people. I could point out a hundred different people. 
Gary, when the doctors say you're going to die, Jesus stepped in. When your wife says, I'm done with you, Jesus steps in and makes a beautiful soul out of you. Terrence Hayes, when murder and crime and suicide and, and, and the loss of your family and life says you'll never amount to anything, and then you look up one day and say, but God, but God, when the devil says, I'll leave you in McDowell County with no family, God sends in another family that says, we'll love you because Jesus has asked us to. Whenever the world says, you've been homeless 15 times. When the world says, you just need to give up. My goodness, look at all those tattoos. The church will never accept you. That's what the world says. But God stepped in and said, honey, you're my daughter and you're my son and I'll never leave you. I'll never forget forsake you, but I'll go all the way with you. Have you, have you decided yet what your proof from academia is yet? What your proof from the protest is yet? Because mine's getting pretty good. Marshall Lowry Mr. Bandman, when drugs say, I'll kill you, when society and all the bars say, we'll never let go of you, God steps in and says, I don't think so. My good God Almighty. Rick Buckner, when you have a car accident and the doctors look at you and say, you, if you live, you'll never be nothing more than a vegetable. Nothing more than a vegetable. Is that what they told you? If you live, you'll, you'll amount to nothing. Uh, but what they didn't know is that he would again call upon a God that loved him. And God, stand up, Rick Buckner, and just show him how good God is. God said, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not finished with you yet. Drugs ain't got nothing God can't cure. Hey, got that right, brother, man. Drugs ain't nothing. But boy, it was in your system, wasn't it? What did God do? Instantaneously? Instantaneously. Did he take it out? Never been back. Never been back. Never been Took back. it out. 38 years. Proof. 38 years. Proof. Proof. Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things. You see, I'm giving you evidence right now of God's goodness. Evidence. What you, you, Sharon, you would literally say to them, what more do you need? You're getting the proof yes. right in front of you. Yes. Amen. Amen. Right in front of you. Amen. Right in front of you. Look at all these miracles. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Right, Rick? Miracle. After miracle, when the doctors say it can't be done, when, when, life, when life swallows you whole, when life takes a child, when life takes a spouse, when life takes all your finances, and the devil said, I've got you, but God. God steps in. I'm telling you today that there may be some in a generation that your Savior came, but you did not want them. But this morning you are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses that tell you that Jesus is real, that his love is is real that his mercy is real that the power of God is real do not let darkness deceive you do not let darkness blind you do not let darkness lie to you because the love of God is chasing you the more you ignore him the more he chases you pastor how do you know how do you know God's chasing me because there's several of you, I've yet to get your attention. You refuse to put that phone down. You refuse to look up. You refuse. Why? Because the Spirit of God is tugging at your heart, but yet the world has gotten such a hold of you, you refuse. I ain't listening to what you got. But listen, I'm going to tell you, God loves you enough that he'll prepare a sermon just to talk to you. Forget the other 300 people in the room and the thousands watching. God says, hey, I love you so much. 